This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungi. My name is Tyler Fornis. With me today is my co-host Fred Moreland. Fred, we are finally post-investigation time. The investigation of Brawl Out is over and we are finally starting to get some clarification. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing all right and I'm happy. Like I, I, We've been talking about this every week since we literally started the show. So I'm hoping that at some point in the near future like we can just talk about non less stupid stuff. So, oh, a hundred percent. I am excited to stop talking about stupid stuff, but we're going to, we're going to do it for at least one more show because we got a lot of clarification. And honestly, all of that started Fred during dynamite. We're going to kind of jump around a little bit here because there was obviously some speculation that the elite was going to be coming back, but then we got some credence to that speculation with a short vignette during the show where they kind of, profiled the elite and their growth within AEW. Hey, they started like the little um, short clip outside the Tokyo Dome and like their title win and a couple other like moments. But in each moment, they slowly disappeared. So there's... They got, they and got then, Yeah, exactly. And then we found out more as the, as the weekend went on that the elite will be coming back and they were backstage along with Don Callis this past week at dynamite, which I think was a really big deal. Now here's my question to you, because we know that as things are going on, the elite is coming back and it feels like CM Punk is not. We're going to talk about that with more from Nick Hausman of wrestling Inc. But I want to ask you this question. Do you think the elite is getting rebranded? Because when I watched that vignette, that was my first thought because it felt like they were, they were, they're still going to be an AW, but what they were is going to be completely gone and reshaped. And if you're going to do any sort of repackaging or reintroducing, even though you're not going to be able, you're not going to change the Young Bucks name. You're not going to change Omega, but how they come in and maybe not calling themselves the elite feels like an interesting strategy. Like, what was your take on it? I don't know. I, I honestly, I didn't think too much of it beyond, oh, they're teasing that they're gone, but they're actually coming back uh, kind of deal with that. Um, but I think that I don't know how much you can rebrand like the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. I feel like this is like what you basically have is their characters and they can either be more of a babyface act or they can be more shit heels. And I don't really foresee them like dramatically changing their characters. It just doesn't feel like something that they would do. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll like go full, hopefully not like Lake of Reincarnation kind of thing. <laughs> um, but I, I just, I, you know, and, and like I wrote about this actually in my column last Wednesday uh, for Dynamite. Uh, maybe it's a lack of imagination with me. Maybe they have a, some big plan where they are going to somehow dramatically change what their characters are. But I just don't foresee that. I think they're just going to basically be what they are, which are the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. And they may drop the Elite name. They may change to something else. But I don't know. I think at their core, they'll be what they have been. What do you think? I feel like that we're going to get something new. And I don't necessarily think it's going to be life altering life changing we're we're not gonna get like brian danielson to daniel Bryan level of difference but i do think that they're going to be something different and i i don't know to what degree but maybe they don't want to call themselves the elite because they got stripped of the titles and it's like uh almost like a story arc to work their way back to feeling comfortable calling themselves that i i feel like it's there's going to be something different with this unit but I can't put my finger on it as of yet. And I want to see where the next vignette takes us. But I, I don't think we're getting standard. What, what the projectile was for the bucks and Kenny Omega. I don't think that they're just going to go on this long baby face run where they're holding the titles. I I think we're going to get something different. 
Okay. I mean, very possibly. Uh, I It's very much, you know, I, I hate to like kind of sand back your, your thoughts there and just be like, I guess we'll see. But I, you know, I don't know. I, uh, it'll be interesting to watch for sure. It'll be interesting to see where they go with the, you know, starting with that vignette from last Wednesday and what that leads into. But at this point, I really don't have a feel for what they're going to do. I don't either. And that's that's one of the reasons I like this company is they they throw curveballs at you. There are some that are just so blatantly obvious. Everybody knew Hangman Page was on this long story arc to get the title. And it took longer than you would have thought um, by at least a full pay-per-view cycle because everybody thought it was going to be all out, but he had some planned time off. And then they got him the title at full gear. And I, I really feel like they have these long story arcs and then they throw you curveballs. And those curveballs make things more fun. It makes, I like being worked as a wrestling fan. I don't understand people who don't like being worked um, because that's the whole point of being a professional wrestling fan to expect the unexpected and not like, I'm a big fan of the show, big brother. The whole mantra of the show is uh, expect the unexpected. And when you have that as a fan of whatever you're watching, it creates a sense of mystery and, a sense of excitement. And when AW is continuously able to pull this kind of stuff off, I think it's really fun and it's good for the product. And I'm very intrigued to see what happens with this group because they're going to get some kind of big run, especially with these trios belts. It's not going to come right now because of everything that happened with brawl out, but it's going to happen eventually because they like uh, the start of the trio revolution in the States is the dragon gate, six man's WrestleMania weekend. And then it evolved. And then you have, like the box and Kenny Omega and they would just go to PWG along with a few other trios and just have insane matches. And it got more and more popular and AEW's finally rolled these belts out. And there are a bunch of good trios in the company. Now, like you can really do something with that. And I think that they're going to get a real run with it, but just thinks we're not going to have it now. I, and I guess this is a really long winded way of saying that the excitement and mystery with this company is, why I'm so invested. Yeah, uh, I definitely can foresee them going that route. I think it would definitely be the wrong move to uh, move the titles off of uh, best friends so quickly and to put them right immediately on the elite. It, that would kind of send a, uh, well, you guys are definitely just play, you know, placeholders. Uh, thank you for your service. Bye. Kind of no. vibes. And I'm not sure that that's really good. Um I actually think it would be beneficial for best friends to hold the belts. You know, they don't need to hold it for like a year or anything, but you know, at least through this pay-per-view cycle, I think is a bare minimum uh, before it's just kind of like, all right, we've been bouncing these around a lot at the very start. So. No, I agree completely. Um, And kind of, as we continue with the story I mentioned earlier, um, Nick Hausman from wrestling Inc. Well, it was revealed by Dave Meltzer and then Hausman confirmed, but he didn't want to go public with it. That, I believe it was the next day that Punk called him to apologize for um, the uh, attack at the beginning of that presser. And it feels like that he got a story from the Punk camp as almost like an apology. Um, so Punk's camp went to and told him the Bucks kicked the door into Larry, which knocked out two of his teeth. And But there are two issues with this. One, why would it take eight weeks to come out when CM Punk has been painted like the bad guy nearly the entire time. And two, there was also a scheduled vet appointment for two days after all out. And that makes things a little fishy. Um, he has claimed that AEW has not reached out to punk since all out. Um, punk didn't think the press conference was a big deal. And punk's group said that, uh, he responded legally under Illinois castle doctrine, which is absolutely hilarious. Um, <laughs> Punk was afraid Paige would shoot on him during the title match uh, after the workers' rights promo, and that was where Punk initially won the belt, um, almost certainly meaning that uh, not protecting Punk on moves rather than deploy a sugar hold. Um, wife of A. Steele, her name is Lucy, wasn't talked with about the incident, and I believe she was in the room. Yes, and that's been people, pretty consistently reported. Yep, people have denied these claims to Dave Meltzer. There's a lot to take in here, Fred, and I want to start at the top. Um, the dog, Larry. What? Like, what are we doing here? Like, well, if you if know, you would have said this at the jump, be like, "Hey, my dog. Two of my dog's teeth got knocked loose." Okay, even let let's just say that 
it didn't happen from the door and it's bullshit. If it comes out right away, that's we're we're likely there's likely going to be people who buy the story and there's going to be a a long discussion about whether it's true or not, right? Because it came out immediately and it's plausible. But this is coming out 8 weeks later. What in the hell are we doing? Well, it's, you know, it's really repugnant that the elite you know, all super kick the door in and not only hit Larry, but also knocked CM Punk down, which left him unable to stop them from performing a BTE trigger on Larry the dog, which knocked out several of his teeth. Um, now, there's people that are acting like that's actually what happened. And obviously, no one knows what really, really happened in there. But it's highly suspect that we have gone nearly two months and it's taken this long, you know, especially with. You know, I, I would say the punk side was being more communicative with uh, reporters than the elite side. Um, I think in general, like they've been pretty open with giving information to, uh, you know, I know Dave Meltzer's got it. Obviously, Nick Hausman's got this. Um, and I also think some info has come out through Sean Ross Sapp. Uh, but, you know, like it's not like they've just been sitting on this, you know, the whole story for eight weeks. It's they waited until the day of the elite going back to TV to just go, oh, and by the way, they uh, harmed the dog. Um, I don't really find it credible. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think that the Bucks literally kicked the door open. They may have flung it open. Um, I think it'd be hard, you know, assuming that the door even did hit Larry, which again, no one said at the beginning um, that it just came up, you know, last week, last Wednesday that um, Larry was hurt. Supposedly, allegedly. Um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, I kind of lost my train of thought there. I apologize, but I, I just don't believe it. I, I don't really buy this full, you know, full fledged at least. Uh, I could see it possibly hitting Larry uh, and that not being good for him, obviously, because he's a tiny old dog. But also, old dogs lose their teeth. Like, that's the thing that happens. You know, you just have to have their teeth removed sometimes as they age. Um, now, the the waiting two days to get to the vet, you know, maybe they called his vet on Sunday, the, the emergency line, and they're like, well, we don't have any openings until Tuesday, and you already have an appointment that day. Why don't we just see him then? Is he in any emergent pain? They probably said, I would assume no, because if, you know, I would also assume that Chicago, Illinois, a notably large city, has emergency vets that you can take your pet to if necessary. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they waited till the regular appointment indicates to me not really a pet emergency that Larry was probably at least fine-ish, you know, but I, I just, it doesn't add to add up to me. It does, doesn't make sense that this is literally what happened. Um, I know that I make jokes about like the young bucks, you know, shoot doing wrestling moves on the dog to the horror of CM Punk. Um, you know, but like there are people that actually think that that is essentially what happened that the, the young bucks, just because they're they do flips, or you know they like the these people like Jim Cornette, and therefore don't like the young bucks, um, think that they're literally evil people. Um, and the and Kenny Omega too. Um, I don't know. I think it's very much a it's like there's a there's a certain segment of the wrestling online fandom that are turning this event into a workshop test of. Which people do you pre-existingly don't like? And how can you interpret and then repeat this information in a way that makes those people you don't like sound as bad as possible? Yeah, just... Just it's all very silly. Like, <laughs> like, I'm kind of speechless a little bit because he is... He is so nuts as far as how he's presenting this stuff. And it drives me bonkers because this is a workplace fight. All right. Mm -hmm. In theory, no big deal. We all have them. And sometimes they get a little aggressive and sometimes people need to be disciplined for it. You don't have to take it to a level where you're just lying about everything. And this is like, 
other people have said it, and I'm going to say it again. This isn't how normal adults behave. Like, I, I am not going to sit here and claim I'm a perfect adult. I handle things poorly because I, I'm human. It's, this is, I'm literally speechless because of how absurd this is. And quite frankly, I kind of want to stop talking about it. But we'll roll this whole thing into what's going to be the topic of conversation over the next month or so. And that is going to be the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame. And ballots are due, I believe, by the end of this week. Um, oh, shit. I thought it was November 15th. I'm, I have sorry. a ballot. I well, need hold to on, hold on. <laughs> panic, I panic, panic, panic. I haven't <laughs> finished yet. I believe it's November 5th if you're mailing, November 15th if you're emailing. So I okay, think good. you're still right. Oof. Um, Oof. That, that's what I was trying to say when you interrupted me unfairly, Fred. So Listen, I'm going to go take care of Odie, and uh, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> Just vote Odie in the Hall of Fame. That's all I ask. That's right. Anyways, um... It it makes for a real interesting case because Punk had a difficult case going into his AEW run because he he's not a pure work rate guy, but he's obviously been a draw and he's obviously one of the more charismatic um, on the mic performers in American wrestling history. But he's never been able to really have even his ten pole title run in WWE was overshadowed by Cena versus The Rock. He never got to main event, uh, main event WrestleMania with the title because of Cena versus The Rock. And there, and then The Rock beat him for it in a convoluted finish at the Royal Rumble. And that kind of, mm-hmm. for the most part, then he got Undertaker, and then he was gone with him from the company within a year. And then he gets AEW. And AEW is honestly born off of um, him. And the want for change, the want for more in professional wrestling. And then he comes in, and he honestly does a great job. He pops numbers. He puts on really good matches. He he draws with multiple people. And in doing so, he's he really built up a case that I think if you would have continued at this pace for another year and had an actual 10-pole title in AEW, he's probably, you're probably talking about him as a slam dunk because he was able to be a true title holder with three different major American companies. And you can argue if ring of honor was major at the time or not, probably weren't, but they were the biggest indie. And at any point in time, I think ring of honor in the early two thousands was the biggest indie in American wrestling history. You have all that. And then you have him drawing legit numbers, doing an AW record pay-per-view by um, drawing all, a rampage high in viewership by, I think it was like 50% more than any other, or 100% more than any other rampage had ever drawn, just on the rumor he was coming back. Like, he had a fantastic case to get in. And now, with this whole thing, you there's almost not a case anymore because this has really clouded it. Where do you sit with CM Punk in the Hall of Fame? And I know rules have changed. You can only vote five per category. And with the tag team rule, things get even murkier. Do you think CM Punk is a Hall of Famer? And would you vote him in for the Hall of Fame this year? Well, uh, this is my actually my second year with the Hall of Fame ballot. And I'm still working. I'm trying to make my first vote on the historical... Uh, U.S. Uh, North uh, U.S. and Canada portion of the ballot, but last year I did vote on the uh, modern uh, U.S. Canada, which includes CM Punk, and I voted for him then. And uh, I actually even wrote an article for uh, Voices of Wrestling last year called "CM Punk Already Has a Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame Resume." Uh, because I think that what he had done when he had walked away from wrestling was already uh, enough to get him in. He he doesn't really get the, the way most voters don't give credit for the Ring of Honor run. But I think that he played a really big role in making that company mean something. Uh, so I think that that should he should get credit for that. He um, a big part of his argument And with the Hall of Fame, three things should be considered. Drawing power, in-ring performance, and historical significance. And Meltzer says that if you fill at least one of those sufficiently, you should get in. And, of course, that's up to the individual voter, you know, what that means specifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think historical significance, which is probably the least valued of the three of my voters, 
Um, I think he, you have an argument there that he and Brian Danielson both help open up the door in WWE to allow the smaller workers to be big stars in the company that had traditionally always, always pushed just the biggest guys that they could find, regardless of talent, regardless of how over they were with the crowd, etc. Um, that's how he ended up with things like Diesel versus Mabel as a was that a SummerSlam uh, main event? I think it was. Uh, um, I actually. 90s. I think that might have been a WrestleMania main event. No, it wasn't a mania. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, I w- I'm going to stick with SummerSlam. I think that's it. Anyways, uh, but, you know, when when Vince was calling up guys like Mason Ryan and, um, you know, Mark Jindrak uh, years earlier, and just like, these are the guys I want to push, uh, the guys that actually got over were Brian Danielson and CM Punk, and that helped uh, change the view of the company. Um, if you look at his, uh, I, I did some statistical studies of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards, which I think is a good tool to use when looking at people, um, but not like the definitive tool. Uh, at, at last year, uh, Punk was in the top 10 all time, uh, going back to 1982, I want to say, in interviews, uh, in points received from voters uh, or, uh, in the interview category. He was um, top 30 in match of the year. Like, and, and that's the thing. People always you know, like to say that he's not a, a great worker, but the fact is he's always had very memorable matches. So he's not exactly uh, the purest technician, but he, you know, thanks to his charisma and to various other aspects of his skill profile, he's able to put on just very high-level matches. Um, and I think the most important thing is that... Um, Punk is in the top 20 all time and basically the MVP category in award shares for that. Um, and you can look at other modern guys that are in already. And like he, he was actually ahead of Brian Danielson in that category. And Danielson got in. Uh, Danielson obviously is very much um, based on an in ring performance. Um, but like, I just think CM Punk checks all the boxes. And the thing is that once he came back in those first six months before his first injury, CM Punk really helped his case in my mind by showing that he was a massive draw. Cause you just look at the numbers that he did with AEW. Uh, you know, as you already mentioned, the rampage rating was, uh, you know, astronomical, um, considering it's a 10 PM show without him formally being announced for the show. The pay-per-views uh, went up year over year, every time until just this last one, uh, all out. Um, his, you know, his first pay-per-view match did big numbers, um, so he he meant a lot to the company, and I think that you know helping push them to numbers that haven't been achieved on pay-per-view since WCW uh, it was a big feather in his cap. Now, the problem is he also tried to destroy a company, <laughs> pretty literally. Um, my favorite part from the Nick Hausman article, by the way, that we didn't really talk about was uh, his camp, whoever this was that was talking to Hausman, whether it's Punk himself or like Ace Steel or, you know, just a friend of Punk's or AJ Lee, whoever, saying that Punk didn't think it was a big deal that what he did at the press conference. That's the most insane thing of the whole deal to me. Because that was just like a very public attempt at like completely burning the company down. And he's walking away like, ah, whatever. That's not a problem. Oh, it, it's okay. I'm just going to have my boss sit next to me and be 100% insubordinate and just be an absolute <laughs> jackass. And I, really gonna... just try to burn down the entire company that he started. And while he's paying me an exorbitant amount of money for how much I'm putting in, it's... <laughs> It's insane. <laughs> that was um, I. I cannot like deal with that particular you yeah. know, statement. But regardless, um, so so the question I think is, you know, let's say you were kind of on the fence prior to, to prior to this year. How do you wait? You know, the the good six months versus uh, the uh, bad two months <laughs> or bad one night, if you want to just. Really focus on that. And I think that's going to be a very interesting question for voters. Um, I I think that's, I'm still going to vote for him. You know, I think that... Um, I really think, to some extent, that this has been 
blown out of proportion isn't the right word because this was a huge story. If it wasn't mm-hmm. for Vince McMahon leaving wrestling, um, <clears throat> apparently, um, that this would be the biggest news story of the year in wrestling. Um, but it's just like it was a complete disaster for the company. It really made him look small time. And I, I don't know that it caused lasting damage, though. Uh, I think the absence of Punk will harm them. It's obviously not going to help them. Um, but it's not... I don't think that they've really suffered long-term ramifications other than losing maybe their top star. Uh, the TV numbers haven't collapsed. Uh, in fact, they've held quite steady. Uh, ticket sales are concerning. Uh, they have petered off in ticket sales, and you can point to the absence of big stars like CM Punk and Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks to, uh, as part of that. But I also think part of it is the way they've run markets. Um, they've run Chicago, I want to conservatively say, one million times since the start of the company. Um they, you know, and they've really hit like the that northeast corridor in, of New York and Philadelphia. They've hit that really hard, and I, you know, like your twentieth sh- show in Chicago. At some point, you know, the, the people are going to be like, "Yeah, I don't really, I, I don't need to go to this one." Um, and I think that that's part of it. I think they've probably managed the the touring schedule poorly in terms of where they've gone. Um. I think part of it is these live shows that are built around Rampage. I cannot fathom why you would spend money on a ticket to those. Uh, just to be completely honest, because what you're going to see <clears throat> is a B show for TV mm-hmm. taped. You're going to see a C or D level show stuff taped for YouTube, largely squash matches. Um, and that's it. And then you get to see John Moxley or, you know, Brian Danielson or someone cut a little promo after the show. Tony Khan will be out and that'll be it. And then you have to try to get home at, you know, midnight local or 11 p.m. local um, and fight like a couple other thousand people coming out of the arena. Uh, you know, I just I, I think I'm still going to vote for him um, on the first pass, th- pass through the ballot I've done. I have him bolded as someone I'm going to vote for uh, on that U.S. modern U.S. portion. Um, so I don't think it does that much damage. I mean, if you look at some of the other guys in there, like Bruiser Brody is in the Observer Hall of Fame, if I'm not mistaken. I'm now double checking myself because I, I think I'm, he is. I'm paranoid that I'm going to say something dumb and then for the next seven years of my life, I'll just occasionally get someone tweeting at me or whatever that's like, you're wrong! No, he was an initial inductee, so I was right on it. Um, you know, if you go through the list, it's not like everyone that's in there has been like the most professional person at every point of their career. Yeah. You could probably find something for half the guys in there and be like, well, this guy was an asshole that one time. Uh, I just don't see CM Punk being this... You know, guy who sees things very, very black and white and will determine if he likes you or not, like very quickly, um, as being so bad that it should keep him out of the Hall of Fame. But it also just happens. So if I had to guess, no, he's not getting it this year. Um, I don't know how his voting t- totals will go. But I'm just not very optimistic that this is going to be the year. I'm currently trying to stall a little bit for time as I pull up the voting numbers from last year. See, the one thing that really intrigues me about CM Punk is, like, I think last year he was in, like, the 30s. I want to say, like, 35. Yeah. 33%. Um, oh, I, I was really close. Hell yeah, good for me. Um, nice. <laughs> the, the one interesting thing about CM Punk's candidacy this year is, like, what it, what does it look like for the tag teams because like the rockers i i think there's a good chance they get in um the heart foundation like you're talking like some pretty damn good tag teams that are probably getting in and with only being able to do five per region now but you can do 15 total um it it kind of clouds it up i think punk still gets it around the same number 
just because I think those who already voted for him are going to vote for him. And you'll probably have some of those drop off and some join on just because of the numbers that he did in AEW. And I think that really strengthens his case as a draw and being 45 years old and putting on consistent four star matches, I think makes a big difference. Plus that, uh, that dog collar match against MJF is arguably a match of the year contender and the story behind it and how he went to the depths that he did to go back to his roots of ROH wearing the basketball shorts and coming out to Miseria Cantare. Like, I think that's going to really hit a nerve for some people, especially those who grew up watching ROH. And I think that you're talking about a guy who's, who could still get in someday, but if he never comes back to wrestling, his case is going to be one of the more interesting ones to monitor over the course of the next, I don't know, decade ish. Yeah. Now, now you do mention the addition the, the, and for those that don't know, Dave Meltzer added a lot of tag teams to the hall of fame ballot this year. Uh, I think basically he got convinced that uh, it's kind of silly to not do things like vote in the tag team of Akira Taue mm-hmm. and Toshiaka Kawada, which is one of the greatest tag teams in Japanese history. Uh, just as an example, you mentioned the Rockers and the Hart Foundation. The important thing to consider with those is those guys, uh, those teams are not in the same category as CM Punk. They actually are classified in the historical performers era. So the tag teams that got put into the modern performers era that are new, uh, if I'm not mistaken, are Jerry Lawler and Bill D- Dundee, uh, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, and the New Age Outlaws, and the Von Erichs, Kevin Carey and David Von Erich. Um, I don't think the New Age Outlaws are going to get a lot of numbers. I don't think they'll even make the 10% cut off to stay on the ballot. Um, same with the Outsiders, I don't think. I mean, you could make the argument that they are a big part of the NWO, but I just don't see it. I think if they're going to get in, it's going to be this year because you, uh, Scott Hall did pass away within the last six months. And that we've that it's been talked about ad nauseum, and I know it sounds weird, but the death bump is a real thing. It is a real thing with the voters, um, but I don't know that they're getting a 60% death bump because uh, Kevin Nash, as a solo individual, fell off the ballot pretty quickly last time he was on, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't even know if he lasted a year. And a lot of the voters are going to think of them in, in the more negative way because they also helped kill WCW. You know, They were contributors to that. Um, so I don't, just don't see them getting in they could stick around the ballot for a year longer than i thought basically but that'll be interesting to see uh lawler and dundee i think will get a decent number of votes and probably won't fall off um because of just you know they're lawler and dundee they were huge in memphis for so long um but i i just don't see it directly impacting cm punk now the problem is with the voting is you can vote for up to uh 18 uh of the acts Um, but only five per category. And as a result, um, you know, you could get down, like if you're voting in many categories, you could get down to the point where your 18th spot could be split between, you know, CM Punk or Jacques Rougeau or um, Hayabusa or someone like that. But you'd have to be doing, you'd have to be spreading your votes pretty thin already. So I just don't really see that happening. Um, too much yeah uh, this this ballot because of the addition of the tag teams is going to be one of the more fascinating ones to follow and i'm really excited for all the audio that we're going to be getting um speaking of audio we'll we'll we will be nice to uh um our friends at the voice of wrestling podcasting network um there will be a lot of audio coming on the voices of wrestling flagship patreon what um breaking down each of the regions uh fred i know you were on last year with rich talking about um i it was the um well i don't even remember how to say it uh it was uh well now i forget the exact title of it it had to do with um bill james's whatever happened in the hall of fame uh which is a seminal book about the baseball hall of fame of course by bill james the uh the famous uh, baseball analyst who wrote a whole book about the voting of the baseball hall of fame and kind of the history of that. And um, I, I, you know, if you care about hall of fames in general, if, you know, even if it's not the observer one that does it for you, but you like really care about the rock and roll hall of fame or anything along those lines, um, 
then I would strongly encourage you to read that book. Uh, I think he puts forward some really good ways of doing analysis uh, when it comes to things uh, regarding the Hall of Fame. And uh, I, you know, uh, I think, yeah, they went with the original title of it, of the book, which was The Politics of Glory. Uh, and what I had done is I had adapted the uh, what he had done with the award chairs concept, uh, where you kind of assign points based off of uh, the percentage of the maximum number of ballot, you know, first place points you could have got in a individual year and made it like a cumulative career long thing. So it would value guys that consistently finished highly in the voting for the MVP. And I adapted that to the major awards from the observe annual wrestling observer newsletter awards. And we discussed that. Yeah. I remember listening to, and it was tremendous stuff. And I'm a, I, I love like diving into like numbers and analytics, even though I I'm smart enough to understand them. I'm not smart enough to, to make them for myself. Um, ben, I, I, I love hearing that kind of granular stuff and there's going to be even more of it. So make sure you check that out. And we will be talking about, uh, some more Hall of Fame stuff with AEW Center wrestlers coming forward. Um, but we wanted to make sure we at least touched on CM Punk now because he is uh, likely on his way out with the company. And it it's honestly prevalent information. So um, we will continue with uh, um, AEW News. And let's, let's talk about some contracts here, Fred, because we have some reported um, contract news. The Kingdom, uh, m- meaning uh, Matt Taven, Mike Bennett and Maria Canellis Bennett have all signed multi-year deals with AEW, which is absolutely fantastic. The kingdom is a fun act. And if they end up getting back together, Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly, when he comes back from his next fusion surgery, that would be wonderful because the kingdom is fun and it gives AEW more tag team depth. You don't ever have to push them like stars because they're not stars but they're great hands who deliver in the ring, work really hard and can be tremendous mid cards on your roster. I, I think this is a really, really good move for AEW. Yeah. I, um, I think it's very good depth to add and I think they're very good performers. I think part of, uh, you know, Matt Taven kind of has maybe the not, not the best reputation when it comes to uh, wrestling fans, but I think that's largely because of, him being over pushed in Ring of Honor at the same time as they did the Madison Square Garden show with New Japan. And I think that show was kind of poorly put together because Ring of Honor was like, obviously, we need to put the uh, three way ladder match between Jay Lethal, Marty Scurll, and Matt Taven in the main event slot over uh, the Okada match. The fans will definitely want that. Um, but I mean, I think he's a very good talent. Uh, I think he's very enjoyable and. Uh, yeah, and Mike Bennett is very solid, and Maria Canellis has a ton of uh, charisma. I think she's a great uh, ringside personality. So hopefully we'll get more from them, that they'll be used appropriately. And I, I do like them better than some of the other mid-card heel groups that have been featured over the past year. Like, I like them better than the uh, the Ben of the Year gimmick, as one example. Um, it just feels more natural and better, just to be blunt. So Oh, I I 100% agree. Um, What's really interesting about this, one, Maria Canellis Bennett follows me on Twitter. So, woo, I'm very very cool. Um, The check mark helps. Let's just be honest with each other. Uh, But I like what what they're doing right now. They're keeping um, Wardlow and Samoja occupied. And it's honestly... It feels pretty good. I, I I like where they're going. I like how it's it's basically a tag team with two singles guys who have been teaming, and they're going to do singles matches for their titles. And it's making things entertaining while keeping guys involved while you don't have to have them in major storylines. And it really sucks that Wardlow's cooled down as much as he has, but he's still on TV. He's still getting matches. He's still being featured. And he's not. He going still gets away. over too. It, I mean, Wardlow like. I, I, I view Wardlow as discount Goldberg. He is over. He's not Goldberg over, but he's over in the same way Goldberg is over. He's a big dude. He's got a cool entrance. He's awesome as hell in the ring, and he kicks people's asses. Yeah. And, and like the spear and the jackhammer, the, the powerbomb symphony is over as hell, and people yep. love it. 
like I, I want to see more of it and the fans want to see more of it and that, and they're getting so in different ways while they kind of navigate this really weird time in the company where a lot of the creative plans had to be scrapped. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, we've kind of, I, I don't know how much like he, he, it does feel like he has cold off. I don't want to make it sound like he hasn't, but I don't know how bad it is, you know, uh, compared to what other, like, I don't think it's disastrous. I think maybe he just isn't as big as he once was, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, another um, piece of contract news. This has not been confirmed with um, all elite graphics or anything, but reportedly Bandito and Juice Robinson have also been signed, which if Tony Khan was able to ink both of those would be tremendous. We obviously have talked about Bandito before on this program and the battle between AEW and WWE as far as offering him contracts and getting him signed. And Juice Robinson, this felt like an inevitability once Tony Storm came in because obviously they are married and it makes sense for them to be, you know, traveling together so they they don't have to like spend numerous amounts of time apart, especially with Juice being in Japan and Tony being stationed here. Um, I think Juice would be a really nice addition to this roster. I don't think he has nearly the ceiling that we thought he did a few years ago, but he's his company is really short on heels, and he can be a, a really, really good upper mid-card heel, especially if you want to continue business with New Japan with the Bullet Club angle. Yeah. Uh, I, I think both are great additions uh, in the ways you laid out, basically. Um, I think... Uh, I mean, I think you would have been a fool to not sign Bandito after that Jericho match. Um, honestly, I would have brought him before that, but neither here or there. Uh, Juice, I think, you know, he he felt like he had a lot of momentum about four or five years ago in New Japan, and it felt like they just never acted on it. It's not impossible that he'll get that momentum back, but that could have just been like the once in a lifetime career thing. Um, you know, one thing that kind of reminds me of is when around 2015, Dolph Ziggler was really hot, it felt like, and he didn't really get pushed. And then they finally did give him like the secondary world championship. And then Alberto Del Rio concussed him. And that was it basically for him being a main eventer or someone that really was more than just a mid Carter in WWE. Um, but this isn't, you know... It's, he's also juice is not entering entering a position where he's going to a company that's lost faith in him, which is the di- big difference from Dolph Ziggler. So considering that, you know, never say never. I don't know that he'll like immediately get pushed into a position of uh main event, main eventing. I can't talk today. I'm sorry, Tyler, I'm bringing the show down, uh, but <laughs> you're fine. Uh, you know, it could happen. I'm just saying, you know, the tools are still there. It's not like his work has dropped off or he's lost the ability to cut promos or anything. I think he's just, you know, was in the wrong place at the wrong time for a while. And uh, maybe this will change his fortunes. But regardless, I think his his floor is going to be a very entertaining mid- mid-carder. And, you know, I'm, that's perfectly an acceptable place to be. Yeah. Uh, and especially in a company like this that uses their mid card mid carders beat lower card wrestlers lose to upper card wrestlers. Like that's why this company is booked as well as it is. You can, we we've talked about the fact that they, they do so many convoluted finishes because they don't want their guys to lose. But uh, the mid card means something in AEW. And even though that's technically not a mid card title, like the TNT title is, has been booked really well too. And gives mid carders something real to do instead of just being around. And right. Like th- these are really nice um additions to the uh, to the roster. Um FTR is booked for the uh new Autumn Attack New Japan show in Osaka this upcoming Saturday um 11:5. So you'll be able to catch that right away in the morning. Um and I I think that that could be a really good match. Uh, have they announced who they're facing? I actually missed that. So um, I believe it's uh, Cobb and Ocon. Okay. Do you think they'll do the title change there? I don't know. Um, I So here's my take on this. I don't think FTR is working World Tag League, and it might be better for 
New Japan to just bring them back for Tokyo Dome and not have um, the the champions participate in World Tag League. I think I think that there's a, that's an interesting idea. You don't have to worry about the champions losing, and then you can just take the belts off him at the Tokyo Dome, and that can that can be an act where I mean. AW is going to be in Seattle for um, the one for dynamite. There is a small chance you might be able to get somebody back from Japan to dynamite in time for the show. And it's, it's a little far fetched, but it's, it's possible. Um, and FTR is, is a big enough act, but also a small enough act, especially with how they've been booked on this show where you could send them over there for, for wrestle kingdom. They could put on a tremendous match, drop the titles, put over, whoever's going to take take the, the belts and run with them. Like, I, I think FTR probably ends up winning, especially because I think Tony Khan might want to get the AEW tag team titles onto FTR before they lose IWGP titles. Yeah, I think that that might be his plan, but he's taking a sweet time getting there, and that could be a problem for either Triple Well, I don't think Triple A really has any plans uh, for the tag belts, and you can question if, you know, what exactly, what plans they do have in the greater scheme of things. But I could see at some point, maybe New Japan's just like, okay, listen, we want to build up Okan and Cobb maybe, or someone else. Uh, we would like our belts back, please. Thank you. So I don't know. Something to watch. It is going to be something to watch. And I'm getting really excited for the um, the Wrestle Kingdom show. We, we already know a couple of the matches, but we're going to know more here, especially after this show on Saturday. Um, speaking of New Japan, um, Mox was a surprise entrance in New Japan's um, night before the Rumble show. He and Eddie Kingers were the he and Eddie Kingston were the survivors in an elimination main event. Um, I have not had a chance to watch those shows from this weekend, but I heard that they were a lot of fun, and especially because the first show um, of, of two in Japan in New York City was a Mystery Vortex, which Mystery Vortexes can be a lot of fun. They can also be really bad but it it turns out that this one ended up being really good yeah i haven't watched it either but i've heard more good things than bad uh i think what i heard more than either was weird you know like uh forever hooligans reuniting like not bad uh but probably more weird than good in 2022 but i loved that tag team and it was really active so uh anyways um yeah so uh, that was. It's also very interesting that at the end of a New Japan show, the two people standing tall uh, after knocking out Jay White were two AEW guys. Yeah, yeah, and that that leads to the uh, watch. My call it. Um, there's that. Uh, I can't talk today either, Fred, because my brain knows what to say, but my mouth doesn't know how to say it. Um, whenever uh, AEW wrestlers get booked outside of the company, they almost always win. Now, yes. New Japan is a little bit different because they're they're almost like sister, like it's almost like a sister company at this point. Like they they exchange talent, but it's not a surprise to see AEW wrestlers win outside the company. So, that, I, there's really not a whole lot to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, just very interesting. It doesn't feel like they were setting up a feud from what I read about it. Uh, sounds more like a feel good go home finish rather than starting something with Jay White. Uh, I feel like if Jay White had sneakily, you know, dumped uh, Moxley over the top rope because it was one of those uh, New Japan elimination style matches where you can score an elimination via over the top rope. Um, it feels like maybe that would have been a way to start a storyline, but it doesn't feel like that's the case. So. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll kind of see um, how things continue to grow with the relationship in New Japan. But right now, it seems that everything is good. Um, this one was interesting, Fred, and I know you and I are both numbers guys, so it's it'll be fun to talk about. During NBA games, Turner's been using a stat so far this year that 3.5 million people watched at least a minute of Dynamite from the start of the year through the first show in October. Now, Meltzer think that, thinks that number is low. And when he did some math, he says that 59% of people have watched a minute of Dynamite watch part of the show every night. Right. And I think what he means by that is he is watched that they watch a part of it every dynamite. I feel like that number 3.5 million might be a little higher. Um, just because, especially with the amount of sports that, uh, um, TBS and TNT have had, um, I, 
it, it feels like that number would be just a little bit higher, but it shows that people are actually either giving dynamite a chance or forgetting to flip the channel at seven o'clock central time. And then they're actually getting some exposure, which hell if you're advertising it during NBA and NHL games, that's a big deal. Yeah. Or even, uh, you know, big bang theory, apparently never been able to fathom that one, but yeah. Um, Sheldon's a draw. Yeah, he, he really is. Especially that young Sheldon. Um, <laughs> uh, the, here's the uh, last bit of news before we really start talking dynamite. Uh, oh, sorry. There's a couple more things. Um, CJ Perry, um, formerly known as Lana, um, who is married to Miro said in an interview that Miro is being used because he's not one of Khan's favorites. That's interesting. And I don't really think we need to dive into it a whole lot, but that is something to put on the back burner and see if anything else comes from that. Because obviously bookers like to use people that they like and yep. that how they like them can really vary depending on what it is. So I can't say she's wrong. He doesn't get booked like one of his favorites. Um, he gets booked as someone that he likes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not love. So, yeah. Uh, and the last two stories, uh, basically, uh, Kylan King following up on the whole deal with Sean Dean and the Thunder Rosa adjacent workers. Uh, Kylan King, uh, after getting those two TV spots, uh, basically decided that she would get more TV time if she went to NWA so, rather than sticking around with AEW. So that's what she did. And uh, Thunder Rosa hopes that she is able to return to the ring in January. So I hope uh, Tony Storm or whoever may beat her doesn't mind the interim tag for a couple more months, apparently. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see if Thunder Rosa actually comes back with AEW. Um, there is obviously a lot of, um, for lack of a better term, slander against Thunder Rosa. Um, speaking, nobody spoke highly of Thunder Rosa. So, um, I'm going to be very interesting, interesting to see um, how that evolves. And then Kylan Kane to focus on NWA. It's probably the best move for it because she's not going to get that on AEW television, but she could yeah. in time. And you might as well get as much in-ring time as you can, even if it's NWA facing Taya Valkyrie. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about ratings, though, Fred. Uh, 997 and a .32 in the 18-49. Number five in the key demo. Um, behind only um, the two basketball games on ESPN, the Midnight Sports Center, which was going to be overlap with the uh, last basketball game of the evening and Real Housewives. Look, there's really nothing to read into. This is where AEW lives. Yep. When it's their normal, it's a, time, it's normal time slot. Basically what you would expect. Uh, it was a solid number. It's not a fantastic number. It's not a poor number. It's a very, it's, I mean, I think it's good. I think their ability to do around a million each week and around the, you know, low to mid point threes every week in the key demo. Um, that's good. That's a, uh, you know, it's better than they probably should be doing just considering the, how old the company is and everything. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, they're probably happy with it. They probably would like it to be higher, but they don't have anything yet that's hot enough to propel it that way. Uh, maybe they will in the very near future. Because I want to talk with you, uh, Tyler. Let's talk about Dynamite. Um, and let's talk about MJF. Perfect. Uh, big, big picture. Okay. Um, do you think... So, so I want to talk about how that show ended with uh, MJF coming out acting super conflicted, maybe a little over the top. Uh, conflicted about the you know the fact that the firm were murdering Moxley after he had told the firm to stop being involved in his stuff. And eventually he did decide to run down and tell them to stop. He didn't attack anyone in the firm, but then the firm basically murder killed him. Uh, we had uh, Ethan Page big boot and then uh, the Ego's Edge on the title belt. We had Morrissey do a choke slam through a table. There was probably more stuff in there that I've forgotten. Um, and when they initially jumped him, my first thought was, okay, I have a feeling this there's a chance this is going to be a swerve. That it's going to be, oh, we roughed him up so that Moxley's defenses would be down. But surprise, we're all on the same page because we're just bad people. 
and uh, that we're using this to help uh, MJF get the title belt off of you. And then it kept going. And like they really, I mean, like that was not a weak beatdown segment. That was a, that was rather decisive. Like it, MJF really got laid out. Um, and I just don't think logically you can come back from that segment and say, it was all my plan to take like four finishers in a row and get dumped through a table and uh, basically die and be left dead in the ring so that I could, in three weeks, uh, take the title belt off of you, John Moxley, and reunite with the firm. What do you think? Like, do you think that there's a chance this is a swerve? Where do you think this is going? I think it's twofold. Um, I think, uh, obviously, with the William Regal promo last week and him coming out and saving John Moxley this week, he was being real in the fact that he wants it to be a fair fight and he wants it to be 150%. Now, could it be a swerve at the pay-per-view? Maybe I'm always going to leave that, uh, that option at the door because it's MJF and MJF has shown a history of being a conniving little shit. And until he fully removes that from his persona, you have to at least think that's a possibility. I think that they needed to distance MJF from the firm, considering what boat, what MJF is trying to be at this point and what the firm is i also think that the aw is not uh, they're lacking heels and we talked about that i wonder if this could be a push for morrissey or maybe ethan page a guy that has talent but he's never really been able to string anything together he's like that that draft pick that's just raw but you have to teach him the game yeah. But he has all the tools to work with. He's like and, AEW's Randy Orton, but he's not over like Randy Orton. And, and they're well, pr- trying to solve that, I think. Ethan Page doesn't have a, a famous father who is in the business. So that, that does not help him at all. But I wonder if they're going to try and establish the firm as a legit top act. You have the rising star in Lee Moriarty. You have a tag team who's ascending in the guns. You have Morrissey, who's the big guy. And then in theory, Paige could be your quote-unquote main eventer. Now, you can argue if that's a good move or not, but there there at least has some connective tissue to why that they may be wanting to push the firm as a big-time act and try to establish more people as big stars. Um, And MJF is trying to do things the right way. And now Moxley got his ass kicked. MJF got his ass kicked. Now they're on even terms. So it also could be a swerve in the fact that they staged this and set it up. Um, I, I, and this is all long winded say it. I think it's, we're going to get a fair match at, um, at full gear and we're not going to have to worry about shenanigans outside the ring. And I don't know if MJF should turn face. I don't know if he should win the belt. I think you can make arguments for both sides. But I think this is more of a distancing MJF from the firm angle and establishing the firm as something in AEW versus having really much to do with MJF at all. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I just, I thought it was really interesting. Um, And, you know, talking about Paige a little more since, you know, we focused on him, I, I don't know how you can not say he has... Been a, how you can say he hasn't been a flop in AEW to date. I think that he has been. I think he's been a disappointment. I think Men of the Year largely did not work well. Um, outside of the Darby Allen match, I can't really think of even a good match he's had. But I see the tools. I see he has a good size. He has some charisma, I think. I, I you know, I don't know. I'm not saying like he's, you know, nineteen ninety nine the rock or anything. But he's got a presence. He can cut a solid promo. Um, it's just the question of can he get that connection with the fans? And it hasn't happened yet. Maybe this gimmick change will work because I will say that the men of the year quickly got very cringy. Um, and I think Dan Lambert's, you know, very talented as well. Scorpio Sky is a good in ring performer. Um, I, he kind of leaves me wanting in terms of outside the ring. But. It just did not work at all. Um, 
and this is a second chance for Ethan Page. Uh, he's got Stokely next to him. He's a great promo. Um, I think that there's you know a lot of potential uh, either prospects or rehab, uh, you know, kind of slots. You know, Ethan Page is a rehab project in the you know considering that he's failed already, so they're trying to get him going again. Morrissey is kind of a rehab project in terms of his having you know gotten starting to get over WWE and then attitude issues and then you know kind of took a long a winding path back to where he is today and then we're already and um the the guns are prospects they are not over yet uh the guns biggest thing to date is being the butt of the jokes and the thing that got the acclaimed over to a big level or helped get them over to a big level i think lee moriarty is a fantastic talent of the ring i think he's got some charisma I he hasn't got it. He hasn't had a chance to rise up the ranks yet. This is going to be his chance, obviously, but he's just not there yet. And that, that's my biggest thing with the firm is it. Do, it feels like a main event group without any main eventers in it, off coming off of Dynamite, and that either means that someone's going to get over quickly and get up to that spot, or it's going to be a big flop. I think. I just don't see an in between. Yeah, it's. It... I don't really see a, too much of an in-between either, but I think it's worth a shot, especially considering you need more heels in this company. And yeah. if it doesn't work, but let Stokely talk his way out of it and uh, pivot to something else. Like You can always evolve a concept that doesn't work. Oh, hell, they already moved him off of, like, what, two different acts before he got to the firm, like, within a month. Like, there was the Jade Cargill mini-run that they quickly aborted. And then um, I guess it was just, just that, that, and then building to the firm. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I, you can always just slot someone else over and someone that's more of a main eventer and can kind of salvage it that way. If necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like th- this company is just fun because I like where MJF is going. Um, I, I wonder if it's a, let me get your take on this. Do you think it'd be better for MJF to slow burn this face turn? Or is this a situation where because he is so incredibly over and hot right now, like he is the company at this, at this exact yeah. moment, he is He's a biggest star. <laughs> Do you want to baby face him and just let him go on the run or, but it's makes it more difficult because there's so much more meat on the bone with him as a heel and to keep building it up and making fans crave and salivate that turn like Kenta Kobashi didn't win his first uh, triple crown title until like he was five years into his career like yeah and the fan and then when that moment happened it was such a big deal which method would you prefer at this point that's a great question um I personally feel like that if someone is is hot to this level that you just about have to strike you know I think you just about have to put the title on him but this feels more solid than um, some of the other, like, someone getting over, but they don't act on it things that I can think of. Uh, going back to WWE, like the, the Rusev Day stuff, um, that felt like it had a definite shelf life without building on top of it. And once mm-hmm. they, it was clear that they were not going to give him that push that the fans mm-hmm. wanted, uh, it kind of died out to some extent. Um, I think there is also that with uh, uh, with Ziggler, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I can't really think of anyone in AEW that's happened to. You could probably argue both Hook and Wardlow have not been pushed as hard and are kind of experiencing that. But I also think it's different in that the thing with Ziggler and Rusev in WWE is that they got beat regularly. It was like, hey, we want to see these guys at main eventers. And Vince McMahon would go, Nope, not going to happen. They're going to job to Randy Orton or someone that you're kind of tired of seeing above these guys in the pecking order, but it's not going to change. That's not what's happened with Hook and Wardlow. They are pushed to stars. um, And Ricky Starks, too. That's another guy that I think they should be putting on TV a lot more. Um, But, you know, they are still over. Uh, If you put Ricky Starks on this coming Dynamite, he will get a pop. He will get a warm reaction. Um, would it be as warm as if he'd been on the past four dynamites getting a major push? No, it wouldn't. But, um, 
the the thing with MJF is that the momentum he has right now feels very solid. Like it's not going to go anywhere. So you could slow play it. You could definitely have him um, fall to Moxley here at the upcoming pay per view. Uh, you could have the story be that he's struggling to achieve what he talks himself up as. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that could be a very good storyline. That could be a legendary storyline. Or you could embrace it and just have him basically be be late 90s rock in terms of, you know, he was the heel that was cool, that put a, you know, all the faces down, and that's how he got over. And then he turned face, and the real shift in his character was now he was just making fun of the heels. Um... I don't know. It's a really interesting situation that Tony Khan's in because I don't know that there's a wrong answer here, but I don't think either is guaranteed to work because if you wait too long, then the buzz will die down and it just won't hit the same. I think the the Tyler Black Ring of Honor World title win back about 10, 15 years ago um, falls into an example of that. Um, or you put the belt on him and he does get really over, sure, but like it doesn't get as hot as you had hoped. So I don't know. I mean, it's a really intriguing situation, and I don't know that uh, it's there's a clear cut answer either way. Yeah, I I don't think there's a clear cut answer, and I think that's what makes it fun. You could go multiple ways, and I think that you could easily justify it. Um, but we're, we're obviously going to continue to find out more about MJF over the next three weeks. And then once we get to um, full gear on the 19th, which is only 19 days away, Fred, we are going to surprisingly have, near. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have a lot of answers about what this is going to be. Um, let's talk about dynamite because and the one nice part about how we construct our shows is we try not to just be a review podcast. We try to talk a lot of long-term stuff and a lot of news. And I think we've done a really good job of that today, but we do need to talk about the show because the show is a lot of the reasons why we have one. Um, and let's start off with uh, the beginning of dynamite, which was um, ROH world champion, Chris Jericho and ROH peer champion, Danny Garcia taking on Blackpool combat clubs, Claudio Castagnoli and Willie Yuta. And I thought this match was excellent. They like you had your spots with uh, Jericho and Claudio and Claudio just being a ridiculously strong human being, especially considering how he's built. It still shocks me some of the stuff he can do. Um, and then you get a the finish of the match was awesome where Claudio gets that uh, that uppercut and then plants Jericho with the neutralizer, pins him. Um, what was really interesting about this is after the match, um, later on in the show, there's an interview segment with Renee Paquette and the Jericho Appreciation Society, and Jericho laid out an open challenge for any former ROH champion. There's been some discussion whether it means world champion, TV champion, tag champion, but I think the essence of it was a former ROH champion. Claudio just pinned the ROH champion who took the belt from him at Grand Slam. Do we get a rematch next week? We could. I, If that was the case, though, I would have built it. I, I don't know that Claudio versus Jerick is like a, a pay-per-view main event, like maybe a Ring of Honor pay-per-view main event, but not like a, a AEW pay-per-view main event. Uh, but I do think it's big enough where you could build a dynamite around that. So the fact it's not announced makes me want to guess that it's someone else, that it's someone that is not really under a Ring of Honor deal, or I'm sorry, an AEW deal. Um, but it kind of calls in question who's that going to be. And I don't know. I think that's really interesting. Uh, it'll be really interesting to find out, but I don't have a good guess. <laughs> so, yeah, not, I don't either. And I think that's what makes this interesting. Um, they, uh, Renee Paquette, right after the match, interviewed Brian Danielson. And Danielson was talking about how he was going to take all his frustrations out on Sammy. And Yuta um, gets in his face um, and challenges him. And it really sets up more tension and Claudio comes in and has to uh, separate him because um, Yuta has always been there, but Danielson kind of has straight away with Garcia. So there is blatant tension within the uh, Blackpool combat club and things could get really spicy um, over the next few weeks. Yeah, it'll be really interesting. I think Yuta's going heel. Uh, I think this is pretty obvious, and uh, 
I think that part of it's going to be that he's talking a lot of shit on Claudio's behalf and Claudio is not really going to be into it. Um, and for example, in that tag match, the guy that got the fall was Claudio. It wasn't Yuta. And then Yuta storms out of the ring and immediately starts uh, telling Brian Danielson to, you know, that he doesn't respect him, Wheeler Yuta enough. And, you know, I can see that being part of it. And that Claudio just eventually is like, Hey, listen, man, you uh, need to stop putting my name on this stuff. So, Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is setting up to be really nice and a really good, um, a really good possible turn. Um, I'm I'm intrigued to see if maybe it's Claudio. That is an interesting idea that it would uh, kind of. That's the little swerve there. Um, you know, I th- you know it'll be interesting to follow. I you know I I can't say that Claudio as a heel would be a bad move. Um, I don't know if it's the right time, but I also don't think it's exactly a disaster if you do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then next we had the AW World Tag Team Championship number one contenders match, FTR versus Swerve in Our Glory. And the guns, and this is, it ended up being important. Um, they were sitting front row mocking FTR, actually wearing FTR costumes because Halloween is today as we record. Um this was a tremendous match and at the end you've got swerve doing everything he can to win the match. And that's kind of been a theme with him um, over the course of the last few weeks as we've been kind of building to a swerve in our glory split Um, swerve hit Dax with a low blow. And then you have Keith Lee finishing him off and getting the win and the guns during the match ended up uh, um, interfering as well. And now you have uh, the acclaimed who were sitting up at the the entrance ramp, um, watching the match, and and it looks like we may be getting a um, an eight man tag uh, to set up the match, which I believe has already been announced for full gear. Yeah, um, and uh, I think that match will be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll get back to uh, Swerve in Our Glory coming soon on rampage because i have thoughts about something on there but uh yeah i you know right now it looks like that what they have announced for full gear is the acclaim versus swerve in our glory in a rematch um i kind of wonder if there will be a shift in that to make it a four-way with these guys but i think it's more likely that it's going to be the gun clubs against ftr in a pay-per-view match uh, i think it's uh pretty clear that uh, Tony Khan sees a lot in the gun club and I think it's about time that they get a proper pay-per-view match and uh, I don't think they'd win, but it'll be an interesting one all the same. Absolutely. And then you had uh Renee Paquette backstage with Soraya and Dr. Britt Baker um, interrupts and then it gets, it gets kind of weird, um, but they're obviously still building up to an eventual Soraya Britt Baker match. Um, I don't, I don't I think this is just a small advancement in their story but nothing really to write home about yeah they're they're advertising a sit down interview between the two with Renee uh, on this coming Wednesday and I just I, I thought this felt like a really weird segment not because of anyone performing poorly but I thought it was just cut oddly um that it was just felt very rushed and like I didn't even have time to process what they were arguing with before Renee told them to get out of there and that they'd handle it next week. So it was just like, oh, okay, fine, sure. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, and as we kind of continue on with Dynamite, Renee Paquette was at the top of the ramp to interview MJF next. And it was, this was fun. Because yeah. obviously we know Renee Paquette is married to John Moxley, and MJF was just being a dick and talking mad shit about John Moxley. And Renee, she gets praised a lot, but I'll tell you this much: she did a great job of holding her composure and staying professional and not getting emotional, um, even though MJF was intentionally trying to get a rise out of her. Just really good stuff from Paquette. And then Stokely Hathaway interrupted. And this was, um, this kind of ends up setting up the, um, whatchamacallit, the the end of show angle with the firm. Um, Look, MJF is fantastic. And Renee 
was the perfect foil for him in, in this situation. Yeah, I I really like the Rene and uh, MJF, uh, you know, chemistry. They looked like they were working really well with each other, and I'd like to see more of that coming forward or going forward. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch, and hopefully we do get more of that. I think that could play a big role in the part of the um, in the build to MJF versus Moxley. I think the focus is very much going to be on the. The cheating aspect, though, in the firm. So, but it could be another fun layer to add to it. Absolutely. Um, and then you had the anticipated match with the American Dragon, Brian Danielson versus the Spanish God, Sammy Guevara. Good little match. Um, I thought that they have a better one in them, but Brian ended up choking out Sammy at the triangle. This was good, but I came away a little disappointed. I, you know, I thought it was, it was, it felt to me like it was paced to be like a great 25 minute match Mm -hmm. uh, that ended after 15 minutes. Um, I still liked it quite a bit. I thought it got pretty hot by the end, but it definitely felt like they were building to a longer match um, and kind of felt abrupt in its ending, but I still liked it. Uh, I think I went four stars on it. Um, It's really enjoyable to me. Yeah, 100%. Um, then he was, uh, Renee, who they're really getting their money's worth. Um, yes, they Sabre. used her a lot on the show. Yeah, which is good. Um, not too bad for Lexi just getting her job absolutely usurped from her. Yep. Um, but she has been uh, pushed back. Yeah. And I mean, let's just be honest Renee's way better than Lexi. And that's not even a shot at Lexi. She's good, but she's yeah. not Renee. Um, then you have, uh, Ray Phoenix and Alex Averhante is with Renee and they're talking about how Penta is going to about to be a double champion. And then Phoenix wants to be a double champion and he calls out orange Cassidy and then Luchasaurus and Christian cage come in and Christian cage says Luchasaurus deserves the shot more than anyone else and how he wants him to get all the belts and orange Cassidy just comes out and said, let's do this. And we're going to have a match next week. Yeah, uh, one small note on this is uh, from the preview they do for the upcoming Dynamite uh, towards the end of Rampage is they um, they did a graphic for this match, of course, and they had a American flag next to Orange Cassidy and a Mexican flag next to Ray Phoenix and no flag next to Luchasaurus. Um, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, I think he is billed from parts unknown, if I'm not mistaken. You know what, th- what they should have? They should uh, pay for the rights to use the Jurassic Park logo. I was building that exact joke. Oh, um, crap. I'm sorry. I just got Lexi, uh, <laughs> Lexi there. Uh, but that's okay. But yeah, I, I you know, just a, it doesn't mean anything really, but it was just kind of funny to me. Yeah. Um, and then you had Riho versus Jamie Hayter. And I thought it was noteworthy that Hayter got the win because they have booked Riho very, very well throughout the course of AEW. And this is continuing the momentum built for Hater to eventually split from Dr. Britt Baker. And I believe it was last week when Hater and Britt Baker were talking and they explicitly said, one of us will be the next women's champion. And that was key. And we're really starting to see that. And I think Hater is going to end up being the next women's champion. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that I don't know if it's going to happen on full gear or winter is coming or just some other dynamite. Uh, but I thought it was, uh, I mean, I thought this was a really good match. I went four stars on it as well. And yeah, I liked it. Um, I thought that it uh, built uh, quite well, I think, to an eventual hater title match and probable win. And uh, yeah. Then we had one of the weirdest interview segments with Eddie Kingston. Eddie Kingston basically said people need to leave him alone because he's fine, and he gave that kind of fake smile. Um, he's not fine. Um, no. and I don't very know. Very passive aggressive. It was very Midwest of the New Yorker. Uh, yes, to be honest, and I don't know where this is going, but it's it's interesting. I wonder if we're going to get a uh, Kingston heel turn in the near future. They need office. heels, and and Kingston is a guy you can push to the moon. Yeah, I don't know if I like. I, I think they could have probably done a little more with him as a babyface, especially before the you know Guevara related suspension. 
Um, but I do think he'd be a great heel. So, yeah, I can't really complain about it. Uh, the fact that they're probably going to turn him. But yeah, it's. I, I enjoyed the segment a lot. I realized it was kind of weird uh, relative to how a normal one would go. Uh, but I th- also think that uh, I think he, he's, he'll, he'll knock it out. I think he's kind of the kind of guy that you can line up for a promo and it'll work pretty much every time. No, I agree completely. Kingston is a guy that you can rely on, and I think that's a really big deal, especially considering you have so many acts that are kind of iffy. Um, I think getting Kingston to be a heel, and you can always turn him back face in a year or so, but he is a guy that's always kind of been shades of gray, yeah. even as a baby face, that I don't think it's it, – you're not going to get a big show kind of flippy floppy deal with a guy like Kingston. You can run him as a heel because he's kind of a dick. You can run him as a baby face because he's over with the crowd, but he's got morals as a dick. It it just kind of works. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, it'll be interesting to watch, especially... I think the really interesting thing is who it's going to be against that he's a heel. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's not very clear right now. It could be... I mean, he... It kind of... They kind of... You could have interpreted the segment the week before with Death Triangle as setting up a Pac versus Eddie Kingston feud. I don't think that's what that was. I think that was a heel telling him he needs to be more of a heel, and Kingston might become more of a heel. That's how I took that. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's fair synopsis. And then we had John Moxley versus uh, Pentagon. Um, I'm going to be honest. Uh, I came away disappointed from this match because I had more expectations, but maybe I shouldn't have had that high of expectations. It, it was a shade under a four-star match, and it was good, but it wasn't great. Yeah, I ended up with a uh, right at four stars. I think kind of just did cross into it. I, I really like the finishing stretch on it. But yeah, I honestly didn't expect much more from this. Uh, honestly, uh, I have always seen Penta as more of a personality than a worker at least when it comes to like what's the strongest part of his skill set um not to say he's a bad worker by any stretch i mean i think he's very good but he is kind he he has a pretty how do i want to put this he does what he does well in the ring and that isn't a super expansive list you know Mm -hmm. when you've seen a big Penta match, you've probably seen most of his moveset. I don't think there's going to be a lot of surprises in a Penta match at this point uh, without it being like a super ladder match or anything. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this was what I expected. I, you know, I if it was any lower, I would have been disappointed. If it was any higher, I would have been surprised. Pleasantly, but surprised. And I thought it fell right at four stars. So... No complaints here. Yeah, it it was it was a good match, and then we obviously talked about the firm and the MJF angle, and that's going to be really interesting to continue to uh, talk about and see how it plays out. Um, yeah. And then um, the Dynamite for this upcoming Wednesday in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Do we have the announced matches for that? Uh, I wrote some down here. Um, Do you want to go through Rampage real quick? Because there are a couple of things. I thought this was a really poor Rampage. Yeah. Like, um, even by recent standards. Yeah, Rampage was... Look, Rampage existed. And I think that's honestly the best best thing you could say about it. It, it was fine. I, I don't know. Like Wardlow versus Matt Taven. Like Matt Taven, he's Matt Taven, he's boring outside of the ten Madison Square Taven fans that loved his title win at MSG. Um I did like that uh, uh John Moxley uh, against Daddy Magic. That was that was fun. 
I I didn't have anything over two and three quarter stars on this show, and I thought the best promo was the Jake Cargill doing pull ups one because she just looked like a badass. Uh, what did you? I have to talk to you about this. What did you think about the Swerve Strickland kidnapping and then torturing Billy Gunn segment? Yeah. <laughs> what else can you say? I mean, I thought that was outright bizarre. Like it was, it felt like just a real tonal shift, not just for like Swerve Strickland as a character, but for AEW television. It felt like it mm-hmm. was a a weird WWE Vince McMahon segment that got transported over somehow, and I it just felt so out of place to me. Yeah. Yes. So not weird. every not everything's gonna hit, and I think if you're gonna try weird stuff, Rampage is a great place to do it. Yeah, that's uh that's a good point. Um I think we would have heard a lot more about this segment, probably negatively if it was on dynamite. Um but I just was like, oh, what is going on? And then they have to have, I know that they're obviously building to like a, a split between the two, but it felt really weird to have like basically Swerve Strickland turn into Jigsaw. And then good guy Keith Lee, they cut back to him in the ring and he's like, oh, that's messed up. Like, I don't know what he could have done as a character. <laughs> and it just felt it was so weird. It was just so extremely weird. Um Yeah. I I you know, I don't have I don't know that I really have bigger thoughts than that, but it was just wild to me that like it went from a weird like a, just kind of an already out of place kidnapping angle to we're gonna recreate the torture scene from uh, the first Daniel Craig James Bond. Oh god, what a what a comparison. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it felt so out of place on this show where like minutes later you had like a what I thought was a pretty bad uh, Tay Conti uh, Madison Rain segment or match where like Tony Schiavone is trying his best to get it over and Jim Ross just starts talking about the Jaguars. Yeah, no joke, right? Um, the Jaguars themselves just lost in front of Shad Khan. Tony Khan's father and owner of the Jaguars in London against the Denver Broncos in a really weird football game. But that uh, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about on this rampage? Not really. No, the, the swerve thing was the big thing to me. Uh, there were no like a, a month or two ago when I started complaining about rampage, it was it had become a show with like one three and a half star match show. And we haven't done that in two weeks now. I, I didn't have anything at three stars on this one. So if I can't even get like a pretty good wrestling match out of it and there's no great promo segments, like it was just a, like, it wasn't like a, a, the worst show I've ever seen, but it was definitely a disappointment. It was like a, a two star show all around. Yeah. Just it, it's hard for me to even watch these rampages anymore just because they're, they're just a big ball of nothing. Yeah. It was uh, hard to get excited for anything on the show, and it definitely didn't leave me feeling it uh, any more excited about it going forward. Yeah. Um, kind of wrapping things up here, um, we saw a Swerve Strickland on Hey EW. Um, I have not had an opportunity to watch it. Um, it just kind of... I don't know. Do you watch it? I know you've watched some of these. I, I did watch it. It was not the best one, but it was pretty good. Uh, if, again, if you're into the whole RJ City shtick. Um, I think the most notable thing from the YouTube shows was this past week, Jungle Kiona, uh, a legend from Stardom, who's now a freelancer, uh, had a show, or had a, had a show, had a match uh, on, I believe, Dark. I think it was the dark rather than dark elevation against Riho, which sounds really good, but the it's at like a 6.18 on cage match with 37 votes. So basically like three to, you know, like three and a quarter stars, maybe three and a half. Um, I just don't know that uh, it was as good as you would have hoped, but I mean, still like a, a very 
random and good, I mean, good name to get if you can uh, on AW Dark. Yeah, um, I would love to see Jungle Kiona on the main show. Um, and hopefully that we get an opportunity to see that. I've, she's been getting booked in more high profile places and getting an opportunity on Dark, I think, is a big deal, especially when you put her with somebody like Riho. And I believe they've had quite a few matches together. So it, it's more, more of an opportunity for a showcase, which is honestly a really good thing for both sides. Yeah. Um, I will say, Fred, I do have something in the backlog I want to talk about. All right. Um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to watch um, the first round of the N- NJPW World Television title tournament, um, Ren Narita versus Tomohiro Ishii. But I, I can't recommend it enough. I did get to watch that, and that was really oh, great. It um, was just ass-kicking chicanery, and I didn't know how I would like Ren Narita as – honestly a cosplay of shibata but it works he's got yeah. the same build he the hair is you've got it on point and he he's able to he has enough charisma to make it happen and ishii is just a great foil because you can just kick the living shit out of ishii and he doesn't care and i don't know how it's going to work for a long-term finish but he's still using that belly to belly pinning combination where he looks like a, like that bridge is so angled. It almost looks like a U and I don't know how long-term he, he should be doing that, but the fact that it would, he just caught him off like running the ropes and hit, it was just a tremendous finish. Yeah. I thought it was a blast of a match. I, I went four and a quarter stars on it, which may have been a little stingy. Uh, in hindsight, but I thought they just beat the ever living hell out of each other. Ishii was the perfect guy to set him up against. Um, and, uh, but I thought it was just really, really fun. Yeah. Just awesome stuff. And that, that tournament's going to have a lot of those. I still want to see the Yoda Suji versus Ishii match from, um, the Royal quest shows. And then Umino had a match. I th- was it with Osprey? Will Osprey? Yeah, it was with wanna... Osprey. I've seen that one. I have not got to the Ishii Suji one yet, but Osprey Umino was good. It wasn't great. It definitely isn't like in the top ten Osprey matches of the year, uh, which sounds worse than it is, just because it's been a, a great year for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Umino was pretty good in that. Uh, but if I had to rank them, I would say Narita looked much better. I think Umino they see as a future world champion where Narita is going to be an, like a, an upper mid Carter for a long time. And then maybe he, he gets that final push. Um, either way, that class is going to have Narita, Suji, and Umino, and all three of them look like they're going to hit, which is something that this New Japan roster desperately needs. Yeah. I, I think that we're kind I think part of the reason, I mean, granted, the big reason I think is the uh, the COVID pandemic and the restrictions coming out of that where the crowd still can't cheer everywhere. Um, I think that's probably been the number one reason that New Japan has dropped in popularity some. But I think maybe the second biggest reason is they haven't had a real fresh star in a little bit. And I think if they're able to bring these three guys back, over the next year or so and like get them up high in the card soon. I think that's really going to help the promotion out. Oh, it's going to help them out tremendously. And especially when you talk about cross promotional stuff, you bring in new stars, you can send some of your older ones or even some of the newer ones to AEW for cross promotional purposes. And it's not going to hurt the product. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of intrigue of what they can do with those guys. Uh, and it's very exciting. Uh, my big thing over the past week has been starting to watch Tokyo Joshi Pro. Uh, it's something I've been wanting to do for a while, and I finally sat down and started to check out their matches. Uh, I've got through uh, most of the highlights through May, and the biggest thing I've learned is that I think Maki Ito is actually a good wrestler, which I wasn't really sure of based off the AEW appearances, but I think she's really actually good in the ring and not just a great character. And that was kind of a revelation to me uh, to find out over the past few days that uh, it's not just uh, her being Maki Ito, it's uh, her being Maki Ito, but also she can have good matches. So, 
yeah, it's she is a talented worker, and sometimes you just need to see her in uh, see a person in their home environment, and I think that has made a big difference as far as make actually noticing that she's a good worker. Because I was like you, I did not realize she was a good worker until hey, I saw a couple of Tokyo Joshi Pro match. I'm like, whoa, she's very good. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I was like, okay, I have new information. I need a process. I'll have to think about this some. Um, her January 4th match against uh, Hikari Noah for the International Princess title, I thought that was a four and a half star match. I thought it was great. Uh, and I went the same thing with uh, a couple months later, they had uh, Shoko Nakajima versus Miyo Yamashita for the Princess of Princess title. And uh, I thought that was also a four and a half star match. So, yeah, uh, great stuff, really enjoyable. And uh, it's always fun to learn about new people in professional wrestling. Oh, it absolutely is. And Fred, I think that does it for our show today. Uh, I think so. Yeah, um, I'm I'm kind of excited going forward, man, because I think that we'll actually be able to talk more about the shows and what the promotion is doing, rather than you know, I, it's important. I think that we do the news for what's going on in AEW at the moment, but I'm just really hopeful that at some point in the near future we don't have to break down the newest leaks regarding what someone said about mm-hmm. CM Punk. Yeah, that's I, just such a big deal. <laughs> I don't want to talk about CM Punk anymore unless he's actually returning to the ring. And I'm watching my dog grab a sock and start to chew on it. So that's pretty dope. Nice. Nice. He loves socks. I don't know why. He loves socks. But um, Fred, do the thing. Uh, All right. You can email us at hungypod at gmail.com. Uh, that's H U N G E E. Uh, we didn't get a chance this week with all the news, but we do love to talk about uh, questions we get from our listeners. So, or if you just want to tell us that we're cool and awesome, feel free to email us and tell us that. If you have anything negative to say, uh, I don't care. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, the hell site that is rapidly getting more hellish. Uh, we are at good, bad, hungy. Once again, H U N G E E. Um, you can, uh, well, tweet us tweet at us there i occasionally check that uh we also have a dedicated room on the discord server uh for voices of wrestling so feel free to stop by and uh that's about it um i hope everyone that we're recording this on halloween i don't think you'll be listening to it on halloween but i hope that you enjoyed it had a good one and um yeah that's that's all i got tyler you got any, you got any plugs you want to drop real quick yeah, um, you can follow me on Twitter at the Real Forno. If you are a Vikings fan, you can uh, follow all my work because I'm the managing editor of the Vikings Wire. And if you love college football prognosticating, I do handicapping uh, for a website called Fantasy Points, and uh, I have a lot of fun. Um, and then this this is a lot of fun to do with Fred. There, you can catch me doing all sorts of content things. Uh, and you can also follow me personally on Twitter if you want for my wrestling writing at, at flagrant wrestlin, R A S S L I N. I love my Twitter handles to be hard to spell. Uh, 60 <laughs> seconds before we go, Tyler, give me the Brian Harson breakdown. What do you think? Oh, the, he wasn't a fit there, anyways. It made no sense. I wouldn't be shocked if Harson ends up at a school like Colorado or Arizona State. He's already kind of been rumored for those two openings. Um, it just didn't make sense for him to go to SEC country. Didn't make sense then. It still doesn't now. Um, I would watch out for a couple guys. I think they're going to try and get a little splashy. I wonder if they're going to pursue Mike Leach because I think air raid might make sense for a school like Auburn, like more of a gimmicky style of offense because they're dealing with Alabama in state just a few hours down the road. Um, PJ Fleck is always going to be a name that pops up in these bigger job openings because of the job he's done in Minnesota. Um, I, I This could be a Matt Rule spot. I don't know. But Auburn is a very attractive place with a lot of high-profile, big-money boosters that are going to give you resources. So how they handle this coaching search is going to be something I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to. Given how things have gone in Auburn recently, I think the answer will most likely be not well. Uh, I do think the air raid had some promise there because that's kind of what Tennessee is doing on offense, and they are very good at it. Well, they're uh, not doing the air raid. They're, they are running more of it. It's a fast tempo. It's very similar to what 
Ole Miss is doing, except they're they're throwing it a little bit more than Ole Miss is because Ole Miss Jackson Dart's not very good, and they have three really really good running backs. Oh, there you go. All right, awesome. Well, that's our show for the week, uh, and uh, you can get a lot more uh, football insight like that from Tyler uh, on the Intelligentsia. And uh, what was the site again? Um, it's uh, Fantasy Points. Fantasy it's behind points. a paywall, unfortunately, so you'll have to subscribe. Cash. I can promise if you like daily fantasy and betting, you're going to make some money that's going to make it well worth your, your dollar. All right. Well, I think that does it for this week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Please like, uh, subscribe, share, tell your friends, uh, purchase billboards, and uh, etc. All right. Have a good one. Take it easy. Peace.